this uh, three session course that inshallah we are going to start uh, is uh, to discuss uh, the life which comes after this life and before the final stage of our uh, uh, procession towards uh, Jannah inshallah uh, that's why this is called an intermediary world or stage now barzakh means a barrier before going into the slides uh, if I explain uh, in an introduction what we mean by barzakh uh, barzakh uh, is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Mu'minun when uh, some of the disbelievers' lives are taken, they say, قَالَ رَبِّرْ جَعُونَ حَتَّى إِذَا جَاءَ أَحَدَهُمُ الْمَوْتِ قَالَ رَبِّرْ جَعُونَ They continue doing mischief until when death comes to one of them, they say, he says, or by God, uh, return me, says to the angels, قَالَ رَبِّرْ جَعُونَ Rabbi means, by my Lord, uh, return me back. And uh, the response which comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَالَ كَلَّا كَلَّا إِنَّهَا كَلِمَةٌ هُوَ قَائِلُهَا This is just a word he utters. He doesn't really know what it means coming to this stage passing through it's just like it's just like when when a child has come out of the womb of the mother and says now return me i want to go back it's not possible Kalla inha kalimatun iluha. and then the verse says ila and behind them is a barrier until the day they are resurrected. Now, behind them there is a barrier, means behind them from the other world to this world, there is a barrier. Now, why we call this stage of our lives? It's a stage of life, it's a magnificent, wonderful stage of our life. Why we call it Barzakh is taken from this verse. Barzakh is not purgatory as a it is explained in Christian uh, in Christian theology. Purgatory is a completely different thing in Christian theology. Barzakh is a stage of life for every human being, as opposed to purgatory, which is a place for uh, for some of the sinners who go there to become cleansed and then go to heaven. That's a uh, the, the Christian idea of purgatory. But Barzakh is a place where every soul would go and stay from the souls of the prophets to the souls of the most mischievous people on the earth they will all stay there until the day of judgment now allah says it's just a word they utter that make make me go back it's not possible and behind them there is a barrier that's the barrier which uh, has a one-way thorough going we only can go through that barrier from this side but cannot come out of that barrier from the other side, unless if Allah wishes in certain cases, which is a different matter. Now, so, it says, إِنَّهَا كَلِمَةٌ هُوَ قَائِلُهَا وَمِنْ وَرَائِهِمْ بَرْزَخٌ إِلَى يَوْمِ يُعْثُونَ Behind them is a barrier until the day they are resurrected. Now, it means that when we are resurrected, the souls are, go- that barrier is going to be removed. Inshallah, maybe I explain later on when that barrier is removed, what will happen when, when the barrier of Barzakh or the Barzakh is removed. So we call it Barzakh because of that verse. Actually, Barzakh is not that world. Barzakh is the barrier between this world and that world. We call it uh, intermediary world because it is uh, an interim world between this life and the life which is going to come after the advance of Akhirah. And uh, 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 it is a long, long stage of our life. We would develop many faculties there, and it is needed, it is needed for our perfection towards paradise. Otherwise, we were not going to be kept there. 
Now I will explain that later, inshallah, why this stage of this stage of life is needed for us. And then it is also called Alamul Masal. So three uh, three words mainly we use. Of course, it has other names as well for different because of different aspects of it. It is also called Alamul Masal. Masal is image. Now it's the world of image or uh, uh, the world of uh, uh, imageries, not imagination. Why there is called Alamul Misal or the world of images? Because we have our soul would leave this world in a body, which is very much like our body here. However, it doesn't have mass. It doesn't have matter. It has shape. It has color. It's lively. It has size. But there is no matter. It's just like an image. Like when we see our image in a three-dimensional mirror, there is no mass there. It's, everything is, uh, of course, just a reflection of light. However, that image in the mirror doesn't have life and is not real. When we leave this world, we live with bodies, which is similar to our bodies, but those bodies don't have mass. You may say, how is it possible? Well, that is a different, different world than this world. And... Uh, uh, we would experience pain, pleasure, spiritual uh, uh, spiritual upliftment, uh, evil uh, sort of feelings, whatever we can feel in this world, it is actually multiplied in that world because this uh, friction of the mass is not there. The movement is very quick, is instant, the communications are very different from the way we communicate here in this world because we don't have that heaviness of mass and matter there. It's just like what goes in your imagination. You know, it's not imaginary, of course, as I said, it's very real. But to give an example, it is like what goes in your mind when you contemplate or when you imagine things. Things are very quickly can come to your mind. They can go... They can move. You can do many different things with them because there's no mass. It's, it's just instantaneous sort of creation and uh, annihilation sometimes. So that is called world of images or alamul misal because we go there like that. Now, let's come to these slides. The first question that we have asked is the arrival in that world. How do we arrive there? Now, we have a hadith from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq that he said, Fi abdanin ka They go there in bodies like their bodies here. One very important uh, notion that we have to bear in mind is that soul can never live without a body. It's very difficult to define soul. Soul is something coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a very complicated creation, and it always is in need of body to perform uh, action, in need of body to achieve its desires. Like in this world, in this world, whatever we do, our body is just a servant of our soul. When we speak, when we walk, when we enjoy, everything is actually experienced by the soul, but the body is the carrier for the soul, the body is the the slave, so to speak, of the soul and whatever the soul wants to do. And when we leave this world, again, the soul cannot be without the body. Now, that body with which we leave this world is now growing in us. It's growing very similar to us, actually. And uh, when we die, our soul leaves this body of mass and matter and goes with that body, which is very similar to this body, but doesn't have mass and matter. That's why when sometimes we are connected to that world, Alamul Misal, and we see some of our relatives, for example, who have passed away and they gave, give us news of certain things which could not be known by anyone but them or us, uh, we see them in the same body, in the same form. And uh, that body is the imaginal body, 
not imaginary body, imaginal body, methali body by which they go. Uh, there is a um, there was a, uh, a a Christian uh, spiritual man uh, by the name of uh, of uh, Swedenborg. Now Swedenborg was a person uh, who uh, was a scientist, but at the age of about fifty five or something like that, suddenly some sort of revelation of the world of Barza happened to him. And he connected very uh, immensely and frequently with that world. And so many things, and he has a book uh, which uh, uh, is quite advisable to read. It is called Hell and Heaven as Seen and Heard. Uh, it is available on the, uh, on the internet. Uh, there is a Swedenborg Foundation in America, and actually he changed the Christian faith after having those experiences. He believed in Tawhid, not in Trinity, but of course believed in Jesus, not in our prophet, peace be upon him. But uh, he was uh, called a heretic, and then they, uh, they founded the New Church. The New Church is now a very flourishing church in America, and all his books are on the website of the New Church or Swedenborg Foundation. Now, in that book... He calls this body a spiritual body. And he had the experience of that body that he came across, many of them. If you read the book, you realize that he's not a liar. He's not an imposter. He really says what he has seen and heard. And many of the things that he has seen and heard, although unknowingly, match with our narrations about Barzakh, match with the verses of the Quran. Although he was not a Muslim and he did not want to become a Muslim and he had seen in Barzakh certain Muslims in a very, uh, very uh, uh, derogative and unpleasant manner and he thought that all Muslims are like that. We know that some Muslims are there like this. But uh, you would see that they are very, uh, uh, what he says is very similar to uh, what we have in our narrations. Now, he called this body with which he see, he saw the souls a spiritual body. We call it Mithali body. Anyhow, there is no difference in that. Now, uh, when we go to the world of Barzakh, of course, we go, as Imam Jafar Sadiq has said, Fi Abdan and Ka'abdan, in bodies like their, their, their bodies, it is entrance to a new culture just like entering a new country, a new culture. Everything is amazing there. And this is, uh, we're not talking about very evil people or very good people. We're talking about uh, I mean, ordinary people like ourselves. When we enter there, uh, we will be mesmerized by the difference of the level of life, the lushness of life that we experience there, the quick movement, the ease with which we, we live there compared to what is here. So uh, it's just like as we have gone to, of course we have gone to a different world, but like we have gone to somewhere which uh, we just are dumbfounded seeing things, different things there. And uh, of course, the culture is different there. Uh, the, the culture of talking, the culture of uh, uh, contemplation of God is different. Of course, that's not in encounter with God yet. When we go to Barzakh, we don't see God, of course. We are not encountering with God because Liqa Allah comes after a long, long time after resurrection. Ya ayyuhal insan, inna ka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan famulaqi. You are traveling towards your Lord, stage after stage. And finally you will meet him. That meeting with the Lord, which of course should be explained in, uh, in another occasion what it means, doesn't happen as soon as we die. We just enter another type of world. Now, here, uh, the freshness and lightness overwhelms people who enter into the world of Bazaars. While they see their physical body dead, it is possible, and sometimes it happens with people who, had had, who have had near-death experience, that when their souls come out of their body, they see the body is lying there, but they see themselves as well, and this is very confusing, especially for many 
diseased uh, people who are not actually who do, do not encounter the angel of death in 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 a sort of um, very uh, solid way when they see their body lying and they are out of the body and the angel of death has brought them out with ease and they haven't realized I, actually the angel of death is like a midwife without angel of death believe me it would be very difficult to die and that's why out of the blessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put a midwife the angel of death who takes our souls out of our body when our time comes to an end so here when it, it, they are taken by ease and they do not feel then they see their dead body lying and they are out of it it is bewildering confusing and still there is no one to explain to them what has happened and uh, well so depending on the degree of the uh, knowledge of uh, people in this world of course the way we encounter or the way we enter the world of barzakh the questions that we have there would differ now one thing is that when we leave this body with our Masali body, we may have become uglier or more beautiful, depending on the way we have lived here. Our spiritual body is very much influenced by our heart and by intentions and by our actions. And sometimes this is even our physical bodies. You would see some people who are, for example, some people who always pray Salatul Layl, and are uh, do do good all the time. You see some light in their faces. Even I mean the actions and intentions influence our physical body. You can imagine how it may influence our spiritual body, which is much more fluid and much more different from this uh, sort of bunch of mass, which is uh, we, we are carrying. Our soul is carrying all the time. So uh, the body lies there the soul is out however there is a still a sort of attachment between the body and the soul the soul cannot let uh, go off the body very easily feels that att attachment and feels that it is house and therefore uh, uh, the soul is buried with the body in a sense the soul wants to go into the grave with the body. As I said, it's different for different people. However, in most cases, uh, the soul goes into the grave, but the grave is not that sort of pit in which the body is put. For the soul, the grave is a different place. It's a different dimension of that place. It is that place, but it's a different dimension of that place. Uh, it may be very difficult to explain, but uh, you can imagine if two people are in the same room, but their minds are in different places, and their feelings towards that one room may be very, very different. Of course, that's not a com good comparison, but when the souls go into the grave, the grave is like either a garden or a pit of he a fire or whatever. It is very different, and everything that we say from now on about the grave, it's the grave of the soul, not the grave of the body. It's the grave of the barzakh, not the grave of this world. The grave of this world is that pit in which we bury the body. The grave of barzakh is there as well, connected to that place, but of course it's a different place. Now, the first thing that the body experiences, as we are told in different narrations, is holul mutala. Uh, Hawl al-Muttala has two meanings. One meaning which uh, has been given to it, uh, and in many narrations we have that uh, this Hawl al-Muttala, uh, which, which, which means the fear of uh, coming over something or being seen over by something. Now, being seen over by something is on the Day of Judgment when Allah looks at our deeds and we feel it. Of course, Allah always is looking at our deeds, but we feel that. That's Hawlul Muttala. Muttala, their Muttala, Muttala means some, is someone who looks. Muttala is something which is seen. Their Muttala is Allah, and Muttala is Allah. Muttala are us. Here, Muttala 
the one who looks is the soul. Muttala is the grave. When the body is actually brought down into the grave, the soul is terrified. Not everyone, for some, of course, is terrified. And this is what, what, what is called Hawlul Muttala. And uh, the reason is that, as I said, the soul is completely attached to the body, yet it feels that body belongs to him. And when the body goes inside the grave, lo- wants to go, we look into the grave, so to speak, and it's a, it's a sort of hole of uh, about one, two meters deep, but for the soul, it's, it may look very deep. And then putting the body there would make the soul feel somehow terrified. And that's why we are told when you when you carry a body towards the grave, do not rush them. After every few steps, put them down, recite Fatiha, say La ilaha illallah, then take them again, and then put them down again, so that it becomes familiar, the soul, of course. Here the body is absolutely, that there is no feeling for the body anymore, but the soul is around. And when this body goes to the grave, the soul goes to the grave as well. As I said, the grave there is not a rubble, uh, uh, sort of a place rubbled with uh, with soil. It's a different place, and uh, that's why the soul goes there. It's not choked. It's, it's a different feeling. Why I'm here? I'm not choked, for example. And then, uh, while the burial is taking place, or after the burial is uh, is finished, there is this. Uh, uh, concept of Fishar Qabr, as we call it, or Zagatatul Qabr, or Zammatul Qabr. Uh, if you can read Arabic there uh, on the slides, Zagatatul uh, Qabr or Zamma. Uh, in narration, we have that Innahu Laysa Mu'minin Illa Walahu Zamma. There is no believer unless there is this squeezing for them in the grave. And uh, in another hadith, which is reported by Sheikh Saduq, it says, ذَغَتَتُ الْقَابْرِ لِلْمُؤْمِنْ كَفَّارَةٌ لِمَا كَانَ مِنْهُ مِنْ تَذِئِيَ النَّعَمْ Squeezing of the grave for the believer is an atonement for what they squandered of God's bounties. Now, what is this? You remember this hadith of Sa'd ibn Ma'az, of course, the... Uh, the, the, the the great uh, companion of the Prophet. Sa'ad ibn Mu'az was one of those people who was very influential in converting uh, the uh, many sub-tribes in Medina to Islam before even Prophet arriving in Medina. And so you can you can imagine what service he did to to Islam and when the Prophet went, of course, to Medina, uh, the, the, the way was paid for him because of people like Sa'ad ibn Mu'az. And even after that, he was always with the Prophet, an obedient man. Now, when he passed away, the Prophet, peace be upon him, went to his funeral barefooted. He put him in his grave. First, he slept in his grave himself, then put him in his grave, then did salat. So, for him with 70 takbir and all these things and people were saying that uh, how lucky is Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad how good the place of Sa'ad ibn Ma'ad is, 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 is now and especially his mother was apparently there as far as I remember and the Prophet said don't say that you do not know what Sa'ad ibn Mu'az is now experiencing in terms of squeezing of the grave. Now, the question comes, if a person uh, like Sa'ad ibn Mu'az, with all that service that he did to Islam, uh, has to experience this, what about others? Now, the reason the Prophet gave peace be upon him for this uh, squeezing of Sa'ad ibn Mu'az was that he was unkind in his house to the family members. He, was, he didn't have good treatment of his, uh, his wife and children. Maybe a bit quick-tempered. Of course, a person may be very faithful, but quick-tempered. This should be remedied, of course, if we have it. Now, the, what this 
uh, sort of animal it tells us is that there are things that a moment takes with them from this world and they have to be cleansed. Now, Saad was a very, very faithful person, a very influential in the, uh, the progress of Islam, but this habit was ingrained in his soul. Allah wanted to take it out. And that is squeezing, which sometimes we have that this squeeze in a way that the brain comes out of the, the nostrils, uh, as if it is like that, uh, is to actually cleanse the person from those bad habits, which has become part of personality. You know, what we take from this world with us is our personality. Uh, the Quran calls it shakila. Everyone acts, behave, behaves according to their personality. Now, this personality that we take with us is uh, uh, sometimes a mixture of good and bad things. And this squeezing of, of the grave is a blessing from Allah. It's just like when some people come from some sort of uh, uh, disease-plagued area and they want to enter a, a country which is uh, not plagued with that disease, they are put in quarantine for a while to see, for example, what they need, uh, they, they have to be attended to, and if some of them are infected, they, they should be treated. This raqtatul ghabr, squeezing of the grave, is like that, is a blessing of Allah. Don't we shouldn't be afraid of it. It is very good, but we can avoid it. Now, how can we avoid it by having good akhlaq? This is actually to remove the dirt of bad akhlaq from uh, from our personality as much as possible. Now, wouldn't kuffar have this zaktatul ghab? Yes, of course they have, but it's not useful for them. It's just like, for example, rain which comes. And when it comes, it doesn't discriminate. It comes on the good land and, and, and arid land, but the arid land wouldn't give any harvest. The good land gives the harvest. And this is the same thing. It, it is a blessing Allah has put in place for every human being. For some, it benefits. For some, it, it doesn't benefit. And especially if we want to not to have this, not to have this, al Ghabr, there are certain worships which uh, changes the personality, uh, and also uh, the behavior that we have with people, especially in the family. We may be a very good mosque-going person all the time, attending all the majalis, khushali, and wafad, and everything, but when we go at home, uh, we don't talk properly, we do not... Uh, we, we don't have that humor which is needed at home, and, and all these things. And that, of course, uh, would, would bring this sort of thing. Anyhow, I just wanted to explain that this is not the azab. This is a blessing. This is yet the uh, sort of prerequisite for entering or making you enter into the world of barzakh. You haven't yet entered into that world. You are still in the in the grave. Uh, uh, there are many other stages that sh should prepare you to enter and live there before living, of before going into that. So it's just like coming to the customs into a country, and then they check many things. They you have entered the country, but they have to check many things, and then. Uh, maybe there are some medical examinations as well, then you enter the country. Here, we have entered the world of Balzakh, but we haven't become uh, part of that world yet. We are starting to go through certain procedures. Now, the third thing which uh, we experience there, after this squeezing is gone, after the burial is finished, is loneliness or horrible. We are left alone. We don't know what, what is it. We are still bound to our graves. We are not yet free to go out to the world of Barzakh, so to speak, and live there. And when I say bound to our graves, it means that we haven't yet uh, been initialized into that world. So the, 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 the Hurba, uh, as we have uh, uh, in Dua Abu Hamza, Ali Salam, Warham fi dalik al-bayt al-jadid, 
have mercy on my ghurba or loneliness in that new house that I have. Uh, this ghurba is before the angels come and tell you what is happening and tell you what should happen. Of course, here we did not talk about the angel of death because the angel of death is before the world of Barzakh. It is a different stage when the angels of death come and they want to take the, 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 the soul of the believer or disbeliever. That's a different thing. But after they take the soul, they are just like midwives. They just take you and put you there in that world. Now in that world, what happens? You have to wait and see. You have to wait sometimes this uh, loneliness. Uh, you may have a very sort of splendid grave, a very good one, uh, with very good view or anything, but you don't know what's going to happen next. You are, it's just like you, they put in a, you in a four-star hotel, and then they leave you. You don't know what to do, uh, what's going to happen now. You are, although the room is very nice, but you don't know why are you placed there. Until comes this... Uh, the first angel that we are going to meet. I have put here, we are, but we are not forgotten. Why I put it there? Because we may think that, oh, God has forgotten about us. We are placed in this place, whether good or bad, but what's going to happen to us? What if God does, does not actually remember us? Who are we to be remembered by God at all in this small planet which is called Earth, in this small solar system, in this small galaxy, among the whole universe, who are we to be actually looked, looked after? But, of course, the amazingly, is Allah is Latif, isn't it? Latif means that he attends to the minutest things in, this crea in his creation. And when our souls are placed there, of course, we are not forgotten. Sometimes we are terrified about what comes after death but imagine if we die and then nothing happens we don't come back to life again is that good of course it's not good so Allah is attending to us we are not forgotten in the sense that uh, 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 the, the angel the first angel which comes to us uh, is a magnificent angel. It's called Ruman. Ruman Fattan al Ghubur. Fattan al Ghubur means the examiner of the graves. Now, this expression, Ruman Fattan al Ghubur, uh, is mentioned in the dua of Sayyid al Sajjadiyah when Imam al Salam is actually greeting all the angels and sending sends greetings to all the angels. And one of the angels that he uh, he recounts is Waruman Fartan al Ruman, the examiner of the graves. Now, in other narrations, this is called Al Malikul Munabbih, the reminding angel. We are told in narrations that the first angel which comes to our grave is an angel which activates our spiritual memory. The narration says that it comes to your grave and makes you sit there. Now, again, forget about the body. Body is nothing there. It's all your spiritual body, your methali body. Makes you sit there and tells you right. First of all, you say, who are you? He says, uh, I am Ruman, Fattan al -Qabur. He's a magnificent angel. And uh, says, okay, right, if, um, and... Uh, the deceased says, what should I write? He says, write whatever you have done in your life. Now, of course, writing there, uh, he says, well, how should I write? And what should we write? And he says, I tell you what, how to write. And then per the person says, I don't remember. I don't remember what I've done all my life. And he says, I make you remember. I think this is, uh, of course, a metaphorical sort of hadith which uh, uh, expresses the activation of our spiritual memory. You know, when our brain uh, becomes old, and many people uh, 
either become forgetful or completely they they suffer dementia, Alzheimer, and other things. So the brain cannot remember anymore. The the physical brain, the physical memory doesn't work. That part of the brain, which uh, is to store memories, doesn't work anymore. We don't have access to it. And now, after we have died, of course, the brain cells completely are out of access for our soul. Our soul remembers things by accessing the brain cells, the the, the, the brain memories uh, cells. And, well, what, what happens when these cells are not accessible anymore? I said soul always needs a body. And that body, a spiritual body, also has a brain. How it is, we don't know. It also has a memory. But that memory is not yet activated. When we die, this Fatan al activates that memory. What we understand from this hadith, this narration, that he says, I would remind you. And then after he reminds, the person remembers every second of his life. It's just like everything at once, at once is present before his eyes. And that is, of course, shocking, isn't it? Your, your whole personality, which was sprawled over a span of 80, 90 years or less or more, now it all comes in one place before your eyes. And then this angel says, now write. Now, uh, this is the book of life. This is the book of life that Allah mentions uh, in the Quran, in Surah Isra, as you see in this slide, وَكُلَّ إِنسَانٍ أَلْزَمْنَاهُ طَائِرَهُ فِي أُنُقِحْ وَنُخْرِجُ لَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ كِتَابًا يَلْقَاهُ مَنْشُورًا Every person, we have attached their book of these, which Allah calls طَائِر, means omen, because uh, in the Quran, in many instances, when people talk about good omen or bad omen, the messengers tell them that there is no such a thing. Your omen is what you do. قَالُوا طَائِرُكُمْ قَالُوا إِنَّا تَطَيَّرْنَا بِكُمْ لَإِنْ لَمْ تَنْتَهُوا لَنَرْجُمَنَّكُمْ We have actually uh, sent a bad omen with you. And if you do not stop, we stone you. Now, the messenger said, قَالُوا طَائِرُكُمْ مَعَكُمْ أَإِنْ ذُكِرْتُمْ if you think your omen is with you. And this is why the action of people in the Quran is called their omen. It's very interesting, isn't it? Our omen is created by us, whether good or bad. Now, your omen, which are your deeds, are actually attached to your neck. It means that it is attached to you. It's actually attached to your soul. Now, what this... Uh, uh, narration, these narrations about Ruman say that after the person writes everything and with a special pen on a special thing, which we don't know what it is it's a different world of course then the Ruman fixes it rivets, rivets, rivets it to the uh, uh, chest of the person and says this is your book, it will remain closed until the day of judgment and this is the meaning of وَكُلَّ إِنسَانٍ أَلْزَمْنَاهُ طَائِرُهُ فِي طَائِرَهُ فِي أُنُقِهِ وَنُخْرِجُ لَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةَ كِتَابًا يَلْقَاهُ مَنْ شُورًا We had attached to every person's neck their deed and we shall bring it out for him on the day of resurrection as an open book that he will encounter. Now, this نُخْرِجُ لَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةَ كِتَابًا We bring out a book on the day of judgment. May refer to this same book or it may refer to another book, which is a copy of this book, which we have to talk about it, inshallah, if we have another course on the, about the Day of Judgment, when the books fly from Sajin or from Elin, as the, um, the Quran says, Kalla inna kitab al abrar la fi Elin, the book of the Abrar is in Elin, which is on the right side of the Mahshar, whatever it means, and the book of Fujjah is in Sajin, which is on the left side of the Mahshar. And if the book comes from right and attaches to this book, it's identical to this, but it is a form of it, then, of course, 
uh, the person is uh, is is good, well to do. If it comes from the left side, فَمَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِشَمَالِهِ If the book is given from the right, left-hand side, then of course it comes from Sejin. Now anyhow, whatever the case, if it's the same book or not, this book would remain closed. This is us. This book is us. It would remain closed. It means that in Barzakh, although we develop, but the full development of our personality would be in Akhirah, after the resurrection, the day of judgment. Uh, after, what happens after Ruman? I am receiving some questions here. Inshallah, I will go uh, uh, through them one by one uh, after we have finished the uh, the main talk. So, if you have any any other questions, please just type it now uh, as we are we 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 go f- forward, and then Inshallah, afterwards I will try to answer to all of them. Now, what happens after Ruman? We have a concept of a companion of the grave. A companion of the grave is uh, apparently our personality reflected there as a friend for us. Our personality with the actions that we have done. It's very difficult to explain this, to, un- to really understand it. Because in... in uh, in the hadith, we have, for example, this is hadith from the Prophet, peace be upon him, says that, Fataji suratun hasana. You know, that ghurva would go away, that loneliness, that after Ruman leaves, that loneliness goes away. A very beautiful figure comes. He asks, who are you? He says, I am your good acts. And this is probably the Bazakhi form of their acts. They did in this world... If it is good, it delights them, and if it's bad, it haunts them. Imagine if you really want to be in the same room or in the same house with someone that you hate most, or with someone that you love most. I mean, these are, this is the difference between a, a, an evil person and a good person. Here, when we are talking about uh, people, I, I avoid saying believer and disbeliever, because... Uh, we are not judged at this stage uh, about confessions. Uh, for example, I confess la ilaha illallah, so I'm a Muslim. It, it, this person doesn't confess, so he's not a Muslim. Mainly, I talk about evilness of the personality and goodness of the personality, because among Muslims, we have many who are evil, and they will have that evil character there. And among non-Muslims, there are people who are good, and they have this suratun hasana with them because this is not yet the judgment for our beliefs. It is only the actions that we have done in this world which come back to us. Now, the judgment about beliefs will happen later on. It's a stage by stage. As we go closer and closer to God, things would become more refined. And therefore, although, of course, it is faith who teach, which teaches us to be good, and goodness is not only goodness to be to be good to people. Goodness is also to be good to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, to be thankful to Him, to be grateful to Him. So when we saw, say evil and 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 good personalities or people, we mean people who either have all these things or don't have all these things. Now we are not talking about faith or religion, which religion they are in. Of course, a true Muslim is the ideal sort of paragon of everything which is good, and a real disbeliever is the paragon of whatever is evil. And Surah uh, Al-Hasana or Sayyah would be the same thing. Look at this hadith from the Prophet, peace be on him. He said it to Qays ibn Asim who was a, a, a companion, of course not a companion, he had come with a sort of delegation with some of the tribes to see the Prophet and to submit to Islam. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, advise us. Now, he said, the Prophet, peace be upon him, la budda laka ya qais min qareenin yudfanu ma'ak wa huwa hayy. وَتُدْفَنَ مَعَهُ وَأَنْتَ مَيِّتْ 
فإن كان كريما أكرمك وإن كان لئيما أسلمك ثم لا يحشر إلا معك ولا تبعث إلا معه ولا تسأل إلا عنه فلا تجعله إلا صالحا فإنه إن سلح آنست به وإن فسد لا تستوحش إلا من وهو فعلك نو no. to case that you have no choice or case except to be buried with a companion who's alive while you are dead. Of course, you are dead means your body is dead. If the companion is noble, then he will honor you. But if he is mean, then he will betray you. He will not be resurrected but with you and you will not be you will not come forth but with him. You will not be questioned about anything other than him. Therefore, do not allow your companion to be anything but good, so that you may form a close bond with him. Because if he is evil, you will not be repulsed by anything more than by him, and he is nothing but your acts. This, uh, of course, we have the idea of tajassumul amal or the embodiment of actions in the day of judgment. Apparently, we have that in Barzakh as well. In the Barzakhi form, of course. You know, when we talk about forms, it means that the stage of Barzakh is a different stage, different life, Akhara is a different life, here is a different life. So, in Barzakhi form, as much as the limitations of Barzakh allow, that's what it means. Here, we see things as, as much as the limitations of material world allow. And in Barzakh as well, in Qiyama as well. So this is the companion of the grave. Now, what sort of categories of people we can uh, talk about when they enter Barzakh? Now, the Quran in Surah Waqa'a, in a very broad categorization, classifies people into three groups. At the beginning of Surah al it classifies people into, into three groups when they go on the day of resurrection. وَكُنْتُمْ إِذَا وَقَعَتِ الْوَاقَعَ When that great event happens, وَلَيْسَ لَوَقَعَتَهَا الْقَادِبَ And all those descriptions. And then it says, وَكُنْتُمْ أَزْوَادًا ثَلَاثًا You will be three groups. Broadly talking about, كُنْتُمْ أَزْوَادًا ثَلَاثًا فَأَصْحَابُ الْمَيْمَنَ You see, again, here is not talking about religion. It, these categorizations are much broader than that. So it may actually, you may find a Muslim who confessionally was a Muslim, like Omar ibn Sa'd. You know, Omar ibn Sa'd was a, a, a tabi'i, his father was a companion, he reports from many companions this uh, uh, hadith of uh, uh, Amir al-Mu'mineen to Kumail ibn Ziyad, which is in Nahjul Balagha, uh, has a version which is reported by Umar ibn Sa'd. He reports from Kumail ibn Ziyad and all those things that he has. Of course, confessionally, he was a Muslim. He was a, a, a sort of faqih as well. He was someone to whom people actually uh, uh, did iqtida in salat and all these things. But when we talk about Ashab al-Yameen and Ashab al-Shamal, we don't say because he's a Muslim, he's Ashab al-Yameen, and because someone is kafir or not convinced about Islam or didn't hear about Islam, is Ashab al-Shamal. No, these categorizations are somehow beyond that, and uh, we should not be confused by names only. Now, he says that uh, when you come, of course, you are three groups. فأصحاب الميمنة أصحاب ميمنة means right and means prosperity and blessing. The people who are blessed and uh, would be prosperous. أصحاب المشأمة مشأمة from شؤم means misery. The people who are miserable. والصابغون الصابغون أولاك المقربون Now, even the believers are not in one rank. The, this مقربون is absolutely and completely categorized in a different uh, grouping. This is at the Mahshar. At the end of Surah Waqa, when he talks about death, when the death comes, why cannot you turn it away if you are truthful that you do things rather than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Then he says that, فَأَمَّا إِنْ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُقَرَّبِينَ فَرَوْحٌ وَرَيْحَانٌ 
Jannatu Naim. Now, look, look at these uh, these verses, uh, this slide. Uh, uh, so when it reaches the throat, the soul, and at that moment you are looking on, وَأَنْتُمْ هَيْنَا إِذَنْ تَنْدُرُونَ And we are nearer to him than you are, though you do not perceive. Uh, they, uh, then why do you not, if you are subject if you are not subject to divine will, restore it should you be truthful. And then it says, Now if he be of those brought close after death, you see, this is, this is not yet Qiyamah. Then is abundance and a garden of bliss. This is in Barzakh for Muharrabi. وَأَمَّا إِنْ كَانَ مِنْ أَصْحَابِ الْيَمِينَ And if he be of the people of the right hand, as I mentioned, أصحاب الْيَمِينَ are probably those who receive their books from الْيَمِينَ, which is on the right hand, then peace be on you, a greeting from the people of the right hand. فَسَلَامٌ لَكَ مِنْ أَصْحَابِ الْيَمِينَ Mean the people are, mean, this is one of the meanings of this uh, verse. Of course, there are different uh, views about what this فَسَلَامٌ لَكَ مِنْ أَصْحَابِ الْيَمِينَ mean, but um, one of the uh, best uh, understandable meanings is that أصحاب الْيَمِينَ would receive you and would greet you in Barzah. وَأَمَّا إِنْ كَانَ مِنَ الْمُكَذِّبِينَ الظَّالِينَ But if he be of the impuners, the astray ones, فَنُزُلٌ مِنْ حَمِيمٌ Then a treat of boiling water, وَتَسْلِيَةُ جَهِيمٌ An entry into fire, إِنَّ هَذَا لَهُ حَقُّ الْيَقِينَ Indeed, this is certain truth. Now, there is a hadith from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, reported in Tafsir al-Qummi. He says that فَنُزُلٌ مِنْ حَمِيمٌ يَعْنِ فِي غَبْرِهِ The treatment of boiling water is in his grave, وَتَسْلِيَةُ جَهِيمٌ يَعْنِ فِي الْآخِرَةِ And entry to fire in is in the Akhira. So there's this distinction here. Now that you come, we have a sort of uh, 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 these uh, sort of uh, starters that you you go to restaurants, they bring the starters before the food, the main food. This nozzle actually means a starter. Usually when guests used to go to someone, some house or some tent in, in those days, while they were preparing the food, the main food, which took a couple of hours, they put something for the guests to eat, something to drink, something to eat. Just like nowadays we go to each other's houses before the dinner is ready, these uh, sort of snacks are, are, are taken. Nozol means that. So Allah says, okay, there is a snack sort of boiling water for them here in Barzakh until the day of judgment when they would enter the fire of the hell. So the different experiences of the grave, we all do not experience that world or the grave and what comes after the grave in, of course, our life in Barzakh. We do not all experience it in the same way and same manner. It's, and it's all actually reflection of our personality. We think that the punishment of Allah is something of a revenge and Allah has convened it in this way. The punishment there is not conventional. It doesn't come because Allah is angry of some people. No. It's consequential. It is the consequences of what you do here. You cannot put a knife in your heart and then say oh Allah save me it's not possible the punishment for that act is death so to speak now you you should you never would think that this is a conventional punishment that Allah has said that if you put a knife in your heart I will take your life no it is consequential it's the consequence of it exactly the same thing when we go to the next one everything is consequential. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put many different stages and lifelines for us so that we get rid of these consequences if the consequences are evil. Now, what we understand from these verses is that people in the grave are divided into three broad groups. The first is the group of those who led an exemplary life, exemplary life, and any pollution that they may have had has been 
cleansed by the process of death, and there is nothing there, no impurity to ever bug them or bother them as the consequence of the impurity. The second is the group of those who are completely impure and any virtue they possess is lost in their impurity. And the third group is the group in the middle with evil and virtue both present. Within this latter large group, there is a great diversity of levels. So, let's see. We have a purely evil ones. Okay, their destiny is very clear. There is no doubt about it. There are those who are absolutely pure. Straight away they go to the paradise in Barrah, and from there they go to paradise in, in Akhra. There is no judgment, no balance, no accounting, nothing for them. For these two extreme groups, they don't have all those uh, stages which are uh, there on the day of judgment. They either go straight to paradise or straight to hell. This weighing of the acts, for example, mizan, balance, is for those who have some actions or whose actions should be weighed. For the purely pure ones, their actions shouldn't be weighed. It's very clear. For the purely evil ones, Allah says, فَلَا نُقِيمُ لَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةَ وَرْنَا We do not set a balance for them on the day of judgment. There is no need for that. However, now, these are very minute minority on both sides. The large majority of the people, 9,999 people in 10,000 people, are in this latter group in the middle. Now, there is a large diversity, great diversity of, among these people. Some, some of them are very bad, but not purely evil and not purely good, but very good, very bad. Then their lives differ in the Barzakh. And they are not, as we will say, a different destiny than the destiny of those two groups. This third group is left alone after their encounter with Ruman and allowed to begin their battle. Now, here, there's something which is very difficult to explain because our mind is set on a different viewpoint. The questioning in the grave. Uh, we, are, uh, we are actually uh, of the view that every person who dies is questioned in the grave. And that there is a questioning. But our narrations from Ayyem Al which is a bit different from the narrations from Ahl Sunnah, says that not everyone is questioned in the grave. Then we have other other narrations which says, yes, there are these questions which are asked in the grave. So apparently we have two levels of questioning. One questioning which is for the final judgment. That yes, go to hell or yes, go to paradise. That's it. And these for these people, the, the judgment is made for the purely pure ones. And purely judgment is made in the grave, and then they live uh, uh, blissfully or um, uh, miserably. Uh, of people don't have this, and that's why their judgment is postponed for the day of judgment because they have to go through stages until it becomes clear that whether they have to go to paradise or they have to go to hell. Those narrations which say that, yes, there is questioning for everyone, maybe there is questioning at a certain level to verify or to establish one's personality. Now, let's look at these narrations which say there is no questioning in the grave, and then we talk about those narrations which say there is questioning in the grave. Now, the third group is left alone. This, these are the narrations which say that there is no question in the grave for the third group, the middle group, majority of people. The third group is left alone after their encounter with Ruman and allowed to begin their Barzakhi life. They are the ones about whom Imam al-Sadiq said, Yulha anhum. They are left to themselves. They are not questioned. They are not questioned in the sense of being judged by Allah yet, because now Allah wants to put lots of lifelines for them before they are judged. 
as for the first two groups, they have to pass another stage, and that is the question in the grave. This is because their fate is decided at this stage. In fact, this is just a final stage to confirm their permanent abode. Therefore, most people who make up the third group do not experience the questioning in the grave. It has been narrated from Imam al-Sadiq and this hadith in Al-Kafi, and actually Sheikh Mufid in his Awa'il uh, al-Maghalat, because not every narration is our theological view, but this narration has become the theological view of Sheikh Mufid and Sheikh Tusi and others, which they have, means they have accepted this narration, which says, إِنَّمَا يُسْأَلُ فِي قَبْرِهِ مَنْ مَحَّذَ الْإِيمَانَ مَحَذًا وَمَنْ مَحَّذَ الْكُفْرَ مَحَذًا وَأَمَّا مَا سِوَى ذَلِكْ فَيُلْهَ عَنْهُمْ Only the ex- exemplary believers and the absolute disbelievers are questioned the grave and all others are left alone. So the question in the grave which is carried out by designated angels is actually a validation of the personalities of the people of the first and second groups so that they can be sent to their eternal bodies, to the eternal abodes, sorry. As I said, there may be a lower level questioning where you find out who are you, what is your personality. This questioning is not for the angel to know, for the angels to know. This questioning is for you to know who are who you are, because now you are a new world. The concepts have changed. What you believe, for example, in terms of Tawhid in this world, has a different form there. They want to inform you who you are, what is your personality, and then they place you where you are. So, if we want to actually go according this, to these two levels of narrations, we can say that Nakir and Munkar and Rashir and Mubashir, they are the angels which make the final actually bring the final judgment in the grave, but others are less uh, sort of interrogated because their personality is not yet finalized for these people their personalities are finalized their personalities are not yet finalized so they just give them a hint of their personality and then leave them uh, in other words, everyone who enters into the world of Bazaar is met by angels who cater to their needs and who attempt to familiarize them with God and the afterworld and the new life of Bazaar and to introduce them to a deeper understanding of truths. Since the people of the middle group are yet unable to affirm or reject these truths because their personality is not yet established completely, they are left alone until they have spent sufficient time in the world of Baza for their situation to become clear. It is for this reason that this group does not experience the presence of the interrogating angels in the first instance. But the corrupt individuals who mock these truths in dunya, both by word and deed, and spend their days in self-serving and vain activities, making no attempt to understand the deeper reality of their existence, are now subject to difficult examination. For them, nothing is more distressing and painful than their encounter with these two angels, who terrifying, whose terrifying appearance causes them to lose any remaining sense of composure and control, because now they are facing with the depth of their personalities. And this is how these two angels, Nakir and Munkar, are actually... Uh, depicted for us, they seem formidable for what they say is not familiar to these people. Who is your Lord? What is Lord? What is God? They did not believe at all in God. <laughs> or who is your prophet? Who did you follow? What book did you, did you follow? And that's why these angels become like this. The angels petrify them when they suddenly, they suddenly materialize from the surrounding earth, as we have in Hadith, appearing to cleave through the ground with their teeth. Their voices reverberate like thunder, while their gaze is as piercing as lightning. In appearance, these two angels are truly nakir and munkar, meaning ugly and fearsome, because the individual's inner pollution has distorted their perception. They see beauty as ugliness and vileness as pleasant. 
they are not reminders, they are evaluators of personality. You see, Ruman was a reminder of the personality. These are now evaluators. For these people, because their personality is already established, it's evaluated and gone. That's it. His personality needs to be located, but what is the meaning of personality there? Okay, we have to stop here and answer some questions. Inshallah, next week we will continue with the rest of this personality matter because the most important thing uh, is that we do not understand these things as a form of terrifying, grisly punishment which comes to us. No, it's all a process of life. Just like when a baby is born, it comes with pressure, it comes to an unfamiliar world, cries, we don't remember, of course, thanks God, what happened to us. But it is a process of life. Exactly the same thing here. It's a process of life moving from this world to a higher stage of life. Okay. Wasallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi tahirin. Now, let's see what questions we have. Uh, these questions are in order. Should I go from top to bottom or from bottom to top if Sheikhana you can tell me please okay now I come from top to bottom uh Just come to the beginning of the question. Okay. Uh, the first question we have here is that uh, whilst reading about the afterlife, one hears light or bright light. This is, uh, uh, if I understand the question correctly, this is about the near-death experience. It's, uh, it's something very different uh, than, of course, moving to the other world. This uh, light uh, may be a physical sort of a distortion of the brain uh, experience, or it may re really be a near-death experience of the soul, uh, uh, and there are many other things, not only light, there are many other things that people uh, can see. I uh, About this near-death experience, I really advise that you look at uh, one uh, clip on the YouTube by a person called Anita Murjani. You may have already watched it, uh, and you may have watched many videos about this near-death experience, but this one is very interesting. And this lady is not a Muslim lady. I think she's a Hindu lady or, or, or something. But this near-death experience that she says is very interesting, and it is actually something which... Uh, brings that idea of diversity tending into unity uh, when we die and, and pass to the other world. His, her name is Anita Murjani, and if you uh, look for it on the YouTube, you, it's a very popular, actually, clip about uh, near the experience. Uh, I really advise, uh, suggest that you have a look at that. And the other question is, is the author of Hell and Heaven, yes, Emanuel Swedenborg is the author of Hell and Heaven, as seen and heard. And uh, the other question, all these are about the, the signs, the, 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 the sound being fine. Uh, okay, someone kindly has put the PDF uh, of Swedenborg's book here. Uh 
we just mentioned how Fashar Aqab is a blessing. Should praying to be safe from it is not advisable? Yes, of course, it's very advisable. Because uh, if uh, the actions are very good, then it wouldn't come. And we have, for example, reciting some surahs would save person from Fashar Aqab. Uh, but, of course, as I said, it is mainly the way we conduct our life in relation to others which brings this Fashar Aqab. And uh, when we ask Allah to save us, in a way, we are asking him, because, because these are all consequential things, isn't it? It's not a conventional, it's just, uh, as I said, you do not put a knife in your heart and say, Ya Allah, save me. It wouldn't work. You do not do all those acts and then say, Ya Allah, don't bring me for up. It's not possible. So when we ask Allah, when we pray to be safe from for up, it means that Allah will actually make us succeed to behave in a way that Fashar Aqab goes away. And everything, like for example, we ask for paradise. Paradise is not just something to be asked for. It means it has lots of prerequisites. We have heard the story of that person who came to the Prophet. Prophet was building uh, one of his hujarat, a, a room for himself. And a builder came and said, Ya Rasulullah, you don't do it, I'll do it for you. And he did it in, from morning to the evening. He finished it. It was a very simple job for him. And then Rasulullah uh, wanted to remunerate him. And he said, I don't accept. And Rasulullah insisted. He said, no, I don't want. I just want one thing from you, that I will be your companion in paradise. <laughs> what a greedy man. Anyhow, uh, the prophet, we know that prophet didn't have the habit of saying no. Whenever he wanted to somehow... Uh, uh, reject something, he just put his head down. So the Prophet put his head down, didn't look at the man. Well, how is it possible, of course, uh, for the Prophet to uh, pray this man to come to paradise and be his companion if he doesn't have the, the required actions? And uh, then after some while, Prophet said, okay, uh, but you help me. And the man said, how could I help you with that? He said, with long prostrations. So you see, it's not a conventional thing. And this is a very important point that we usually miss. We think that these things are conventional, and if we ask, it just happens like that. No, if we ask, Allah will make us in a way to... Uh, to actually find those prerequisites. So when the Prophet said long prostration means you should actually require those prerequisites with uh, this long prostration. Now, the other question is, you said that the squeezing of the grave is blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then what happens on the day of judgment? Are we cleansed by then or there will still be more punishment waiting? You call it punishment. I don't call it punishment. Uh, yes, of course, there are many, many, many stages that if we are impure, we have to pass through. Allah doesn't let us just go to hell easily, you know. He has put lots of barriers on the way that we, God forbid, do not just uh, rush down towards hell. And those barriers would look like punishment for us because they are, of course, not pleasant. However, it is a, is a blessing of Allah not letting us just rush down the slope of, uh, uh, of hell. For example, one stage, as soon as people are, uh, uh, are raised in the Day of Judgment, we have this idea of sweating. Sweating in a way that would, the sweat would flow on the earth and comes up the knees and sometimes comes up to the mouth. It is, a, again, just something like Fashar uh, al this infection process of the soul, which has an effect on the body there, which sweats and such things. Yes, there are lots of these stages waiting for us. Inshallah, we don't experience these stages because we, we should not need them. If our acts are clean here, we should not need them. This is why all the NBA prophets, all of them have come and told us that be good, uh, do worship your Lord, remember God, remember your duties towards others. It's all because we are not kept kept in those 
uh, difficult stations which is on the way of hell. They are on the he- way of hell, actually. Uh, is Ayat 10 in Surah Waqa referring to Ahlul Bayt? Ayat 10 is which one? Probably. Of course, it's re- one of the uh, the best instances of that are Ahlul Bayt, but it's not restricted to them. There are many Sabiqun, as the Quran says, Sullatun min al awwalin wa qalilun min al akhirin. Ahlul Bayt from, are from those qalil who are from akhirin of uh, Mugharrabun. In the past, Prophets, awliya Allah, awliya prophets, oh, they're all from Muqarrabun, a, a, a huge number of people. It was mentioned that if we have any question, we should type it now. <laughs> okay. Uh, is that on this chat or somewhere else? Yes, of course, on this chat as well, I'm reading it. Uh, sorry, yes, this has been answered by, by the coordinator. Uh, why is uh, mm, these are not questions and these are just comments about the line Okay, this is again to the coordinator. Is it possible to get the recording of the next week? Now, the next question. Is it correct in saying that the grave is like a portal that the soul enters and that the companion that accompanies the soul, as well as Munkar and Nakir, are reflections of the actual person's being? Kind of like Alice in Wonderland through the looking glass. Or am I totally off in this interpretation? I don't know what about Alice in the Wonderland. I haven't watched it. But yes, of course, you are true. You, you are right. It's true. That uh, anything we see there is reflection. Even the angel of death may be very grisly because it reflects our souls like a mirror and may be very beautiful. Again, reflecting our souls. That's true. Uh, yes, Anita, Anita Murjani, Anita Murjani, uh, Murjani, I think it's M-O-O-R-J-A-N-I, I think so, I'm not sure. Uh, is the first group those who led a pure and exemplary life limited to the Ambiya, Aemma, Awliya, can one reach such a station? Yes, of course, people can reach, and sometimes even death would be the final purifier for those who have some impurity, and Allah may place them there. It is possible that ordinary people, not masumin, but people who are really, really good in their lives, but it's very, very difficult to be really, really good. I mean, even sometimes when we shout at our children or when we argue with uh, our spouse, that would take us away from being really good. Even sometimes when we, uh, we, for example, do something against some people or even don't do anything, indicate something which would harm someone, these are the things that we have to avoid to be purely good. And inshallah, this would, would be possible. Uh, yes, Wajiha Kanji has written here, Anita Murjani. I think that's the, the right uh, uh, spelling of the name. Mm. Whilst the buried person is freshly buried, recitation of the Quran nearer to the grave is good. Of course, it's good. Yes, and the du'as and the talqeen and all these things are very good. The uh, the soul still feels this world, and the connection is not yet uh, cut off completely, and it wouldn't cut off for many, many years, of course. Uh, we will discuss that later on. A uh, recitation of Surah Al-Mulk. Uh, sorry. Uh,
Do restoration of Surah Al-Mulk safe from Fashar Qabr? It is said so. As I said, it is somehow facilitating. It's not the final cause. It's facilitating when you recite Surah Al-Mulk and you actually... Uh, it creates some spiritual atmosphere in your soul, then, of course, that would lead to acts which would uh, stop Fashar Qab. What are the effects of Quran recitation after one dies in his or her soul? Now, we'll talk about this, what we take from this world with us, inshallah, later on. when we see our dead relatives in our dreams communicating an event which has not yet happened, are these messages to us? Maybe, yes. You know, our knowledge increases when we go there. As our uh, agility increases, our knowledge increases as well. And this is not something uh, limited to believers. A soul which goes there would find bigger, uh, bigger, sort of environment and bigger area of influence in terms of time and the space and sometimes yes it may be message to us every soul should die when would our soul die inshallah after 120 years you will die but death is not a bad thing to come and maybe there is an allusion in this uh, question it means that when should we think about our death uh, is it correct to say that when we are questioned about who our God is, we will only be able to answer the question based on what we believed in the dunya, since our memory only contains what we were reminded about? The it's uh, it's true in a sense. As I said, these are not uh, these are not questions in the true sense. They are actually lessons to us. And, uh, uh, yes, of course, they are bringing out what we had about God in this world. You know, we may just believe in one God, but worship, remembrance of God, brings much knowledge of God to your mind, to your heart, a knowledge which cannot be described. So your Lord is that. Your Lord is what you know. This is what they verify. And then they place you where you have reached, you have reached this level of understanding of God, and that is where you are placed. Uh, uh, Did I understand you right, that the soul enters the grave, but not the head, the dead physical body? No, both of them, of course, the dead physical body enters the grave, but when we talk about grave, we talk about two different dimensions, for the soul and for the body. For the body is what we see, and for the soul is what we do not see. The soul is in a new body without mass or matter. That's right. So where is Barzakh? Is it another sphere? And we also hear that after death, the soul leaves and goes to alam methal. Yeah, alam methal should be. There's a question mark here. Uh, you know, Barzakh is where the soul enters after death. Death. And, of course, as I said, there is a custom there. Initially, you have to enter that custom. From that custom, then you are let into Barzakh. Uh, the, these are two dimensions. This world is one dimension. Barzakh is another dimension. And when we talk about grave, we always talk about a dimension of grave, which is physical, in which the body rots and goes and these, these members, and a direction, dimension of grave, which is Barzakhi dimension, and it is, of course, something which would not perish. What kind of people will receive the Shafa of Prophet Muhammad? This is Shafa, of course, is the last stage in the Akhirah. We have no Shafa in Barzakh, so we don't talk about Shafa now. Uh, what benefit did that person receive by us reciting Surah Fatah for dead people? It's just like you give them a gift, but this gift, Surah Fatah, 
wouldn't reach them in form of Surah Fata. It reached, it's translated. It's a converted currency. It's changed into a currency of the world of Barzakh and reaches them. If it has benefit, then isn't it against the justice of Allah? Why is it against? It should be against the justice if you give a gift to someone. A person is supposed to be benefited by their deeds and not Surah Fatiha. Is there a narration mentioned that we should recite Surah Fatiha? Not that we should. We could do it, and it goes to them as a gift. And this is not, of course, against justice of Allah if people give gifts, gifts to each other. Is there any acts that our family members can do after the marhum that would help the marhum during Feshar Qabr? Or would that be too late? It's too late. The Prophet couldn't do anything for Sa'ad ibn Ma'az, so probably we couldn't do anything for our disease. Deceased. Are we allowed to communicate with the departed souls directly or with help of a medium? It is not advisable at all, uh, especially through mediums, because uh, they try to communicate with the soul. They don't know what type of creatures they come. There are usually gens around. They try to tease and entertain themselves by coming and uh, uh, posing themselves as the deceased people and communicating with you. Also, what is meant that the third group is left to themselves? Can we call upon Allah and seek intercession of Ahlul Bayt? Not here. There is no intercession here. Intercession is the last, last bit of lifeline after the Sarat. To the coordinators, okay. That's uh, something to coordinate has. During Barzakh, will we be able to meet our family? Yes, of course, and we live a family life, inshallah, happily there. Uh, can one compare Fashar Qab like the kind of pain that one goes through when delivering? Yes, we can. Is there some kind of similar between these two events? beginning in life in a certain realm of existence. Yes, uh, actually it is. And uh, uh, that's for Shah Of course, uh, the, the, the simile of, uh, I don't know, coming to this world and uh, uh, going to Barzakh is mainly between the moment of death. The moment of death is something very, very, of course, uh, uh, crucial. Uh, and we haven't talk, we don't talk about death here because of course that's a prior uh, stage to to Barzakh. But maybe inshallah, once we talk about death, angel of death, angels of death, and such things. But yeah, the simile is right. Uh, okay, and is it? Only this, is it only the souls that feel the punishment in Barzakh, or does the body feel? The body is nothing anymore. The body is dead, and there is no feeling, no nerves, no senses, no brain, so the body doesn't feel anything. Ayatollah Khomeini mentions in his treatise that it is very difficult. If he says it is difficult, then how difficult would it be for the normal soul? Yes, that is right. The... Okay. Why is the Talqin recited if Ruman is activating the memory? I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, Talqin is recited before the memory is activated. And I don't know what effect it would have if we say that they are not questioned in the grave, the ordinary people. But maybe, maybe... What Ruman reminds is what we have done. Talqin is what probably we haven't done and what we haven't learned, which is going to be taught to us by this so that we can remember it. How long are we in Qurba for? Hopefully not long, I don't know. Uh, okay... Is the Quran, in the Quran there is a verse stating that your hands and your eyes will testify. This is for the day of, day of judgment. It's not for here yet. We don't discuss it now. Martyr people go directly to Barzakh or heaven. Depends. Uh, uh, Martyr people in Barzakh are treated very specially, but it, they have different places there. We'll discuss about martyrs later on, inshallah. And... Uh, 
any book? Well, I have written a book actually, which is uh, uh, what I'm saying is just a summary of the book uh, Towards Eternal Life, which you can buy it uh, as an e-book from Hujat's bookshop. Uh, we have heard lectures where the Bibi Fatima and Imam Ali would come help you in your grave. Is that correct? We talk about that later, inshallah. Uh, okay, I have to go for Salat. Now, there are some uh, questions which are left, uh, which uh, uh, would go unanswered. I, I hope the the the, the, the the audience uh, kindly remind me of these questions next week. Inshallah, we'll uh, meet again next week, and I hope uh, uh, this was something beneficial. And I would li- would like I would like to thank uh, the organizers and the AAR ALI uh, organization. Inshallah, Allah would bless them all and bless you all. Wassalamu ala Muhammadin wa alihi tahirin.